my first love, and my first life. In fact, did you know that my first word was indeed book? Those of you familiar with deep flower gothic lore probably know that I enjoy reading and writing, and I wanted to be an author when I was younger. I still write for my IRL job, but it's not like novels or stories. It's all nonfiction. Sorry, past me. But to be fair, it is exceptionally difficult to get your book published as a first time author. I won't get into specifics, but it often takes months, if not years, for a publisher or an agent to even consider your work. That's where self-publishing comes in. You have your Wattpads and your Amazons and your, uh, Smashwords's that allow authors to publish their works of varying quality. And by varying, I mean bad. A lot of them are bad or porn or badly written porn. One such self-published masterpiece is the topic of today's video. 2017's Mystery Date by Amber Nadine. So for my first real video of 2023, I'm gonna do a bit of a return to form and read slash review Miss Nadine's debut novel. That's right, I'm back! Fuckers. So y'all probably have a lot of questions. How did you find this book? What is this book? Why are you reviewing this one, you weird fuck? I'll answer one at a time. I was introduced to Mystery Date in 2019 by my college friend, Vanessa, who did some voices for a couple of my older videos. And according to her, it was a mess. She got her copy from a friend who was also friends with Amber Nadine. And she told me an anecdote that perfectly encapsulates the author's behavior. The one time Vanessa met Amber, their mutual friend was getting married. What was Amber's wedding gift to the happy couple? A signed copy of Mystery Date, of course. For reference, Amber would have been in her early 20s during this wedding. At the reception, there were these gorgeous centerpieces, I don't remember the specifics, unfortunately, that the bride was giving away to her close friends. Vanessa got a centerpiece. Amber repeatedly asked the bride when she was going to get a centerpiece until the bride snapped and said, you aren't getting one. Now, Amber spends her days on the interwebs promoting her music, which is the bread and butter of her brand. According to Amber herself, Pennsylvanian born Amber Nadine began singing and songwriting in her teens and hasn't looked back from piano ballads to upbeat acoustic guitar numbers, Amber presents her stories of life, love, and faith with undeniable, evocative emotion in her voice. Amber's desire is to honestly share her experience through song with perspective and heart that leaves listeners feeling hopeful in difficult times. Now, before I give my opinion on her music, you must know that Amber Nadine loves Taylor Swift. Like, a lot. At Taylor Swift 13, have you seen a very kitten cocktail party on Hulu? It's literally just a TV show of cute kittens dressed in Christmas outfits in a holiday themed room. And I feel like it's the theme for your Christmas life. At Taylor Nation 13, hashtag Taylor Swift. Guys, are we allowed to buy ticks for two shows? Right now I'm in the waiting room for my primary show choice, but I want ticks to my secondary show so I can bring my parents too. Help! Hashtag TS the Eras Tour at TaylorNation13. It's to the point where I'ma have to start taking out a loan to buy all the different at Taylor Swift 13 albums. My beach house is there. So sad for those that didn't evacuate. And there's nothing wrong with being super into something. Hell, 
I've been on that boat multiple times. It's practically the selling point of my goddamn channel. But Amber's music is essentially her trying to be Taylor Swift. I'm the cold, but I wouldn't mind living in a snowball. Here around with the beauty of the snow, but none of the cold in town. Like, she's not a bad musician at all. She just needs to find her own voice and get better at mixing. Through the walls of the painted in blue just for you cause that's how you like it a deadly flower hidden from me. Now Mystery Date is Amber's debut and as of this filming, only novel. Other than this, she wrote two novellas that I won't get into because she was a minor when she wrote them and an anorexia self-help book? Huh? According to the book's Amazon page. What would you do if you found your ex on a dating site? Would you message them pretending to be someone else? That's what Rain Parrington did but she wasn't the only person pretending to be someone else. Grab a copy of Mystery Date to find out why Rain should fear for her life. And according to the back cover... In this thriller suspense novel, the saying, be careful who you meet online, couldn't be more fitting. After Rain Parrington's boyfriend suddenly leaves her, she finds herself joining DateMe.com due to her best friend Ollie's suggestion. When she realizes that her now ex-boyfriend, Adam Lanes, is also on the dating site, she finds herself posing as Taylor Jones as she tries to win back his affection. But is Rain the only one pretending to be someone else? In other words, is Adam really Adam? Dun dun dun. And I'm gonna tell y'all right now, Mystery Date is not a thriller novel, nor is it a suspense novel. The beginning was all right in an, oh my God, does this adult really think this is how the world works kind of way. The middle was mostly dull and there's no real suspense until the last like 20 pages. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Come along with me and my 200 intellect and let's dive into mystery date and see why Rain, with a Y, should fear for her life. But first, for those new to my content, I tend to have a set of rules and disclaimers before the meat of my video, partly for legal reasons and partly to clarify my creatorial intent. So here are the rules and disclaimers for this video. One, obviously do not harass anyone I mention in this video. Don't attempt to contact Amber or any of her family and friends. We're only here to have a laugh at her work. Two, I am not a certified therapist or psychologist. Don't take anything brain-wise I say as concrete advice. I am not here to diagnose anyone. This one will make sense later, I promise. Three, if you disagree with me and want to express it, sure. But any comments attacking me or anyone else will be reported. Please behave yourselves. And four, once again, seriously y'all, do not attempt to contact Amber Nadine. And now, on with the show. Let us dive in to Mystery Date. We start on October 4th, 2011 with this opening sentence. I'm crying. No, I'm sobbing. And fucking hell. The thing about opening sentences is that they need to hook the reader. It's the first impression of your work and you only have one shot at it. So it better be good. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. All this happened more or less. It was a bright, cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. This is a tale of a meeting of two lonesome, skinny, fairly old white men on a planet which was dying fast. See how those books 
pull you in? Don't you feel like you want more after those sentences? Whether or not the book aged well, you're intrigued, no? Right now, I have no reason to care about the narrator of Mystery Date, who is sobbing for God knows what reason. This isn't a good way to start your work, and it never will be. The narrator continues. My head is throbbing from dehydration and my chest aches from a sickness that most all humans have the misfortune of experiencing love. It's an evil that creeps inside its victims and squeezes until there's nothing left. It has a power unlike any other. For some, it makes them invincible. Nothing in this world or the next can harm a person when they are in love. But for others, like me at the moment, it can tear them to shreds. This kind of love is most commonly known as the unrequited love. A love that once was beautiful and thrilling and then suddenly gone. I'm just gonna read my notes for this part, which say, quote, I have no reason to care about you right now. Shut up! We don't know anything about this person, and thus, we have no reason to care about her. All we know is that this person is experiencing heartbreak, but we have no context for it. Our protagonist muses for a little while longer about heartbreak as if she's a teenager, even skipping work because she's oh so depressed. We then cut to the next day. We learn our narrator is Rain with a Y instead of an I. It's stupid as it sounds, and she's still very sad. There is a pounding on Rain's door, and she answers to see her best friend, Ollie. Ollie is justifiably worried after she went radio silent. As he puts it, I hopped in the taxi on 5th yesterday, just like always, and do you know what happened? I got a fight for harassment because I jumped a taxi into a taxi with an old lady and her dog. She looked and acted as though she was the Queen of England, but we both know she wasn't worth more than you or me. Regardless, after going to the police station and going through all the paperwork and trying to find a way to keep it all my criminal record, I decided to call you to see what happened. Imagine my worry when you didn't answer! One in the afternoon and my best friend won't answer her phone. I had five missed calls from Kent and two voicemails of him asking where you were because thanks to you, neither of us showed up to work. I called Jackie and Edward and everyone from our floor and none of them had seen you since the day before yesterday. How could you do that to a person, Rain? As per my notes, first off, no human being on the planet talks like this. And second, what the fuck is the point of all this expository bullshittery? Like, that could have been condensed into an, I spent all day yesterday trying to get in touch with you. I was so worried. Are you okay? And it would have had the same, if not better, effect. Rain, still recovering from her heartbreak, explains what happened between her and her ex, Adam. He had been avoiding me for a few days, and I didn't know why. He only called me once each day, and even then he was distant. We talked, but he was somewhere far away. I could sense what was coming, but I willed myself not to believe it. I take a minute to cry into Ollie's sleeve, and then continue. And he called me and said he wanted to take me out to dinner and said it had to be that kind. I felt no prize within me, but he refused to pick me up. Said he'd meet me at Ed's Grill at 9. It was a week night, so yeah, I thought it was strange that he wanted to meet that late. But still, I went and spent two hours picking out a dress, putting on makeup, and brushing my hair. Ollie cut me off. Whoa, uh, excuse me, miss. Have you seen my best friend? She looks just like you, only she doesn't put that much effort into getting ready. Ever! I laugh and sniff back some tears. Yeah, I know, that's completely not me. But I was worried I was losing him. And you thought putting an hour and 45 minutes extra prep time would make you not lose him? I don't know what I thought, but would you please stop interrupting me? I can barely think about all this, let alone speak it. He's taking my mind off my pain, which I love, but hate all at the same time. I don't want to be harsh with him, but I need to finish the story before I completely fall apart. Again, 
Sure, sorry, he's serious again now. I got to Ed's and found him, but he had already ordered his food. Could I arrive? But he hadn't touched it. That's when I knew something was wrong. I got, but he had already ordered his food. It had arrived, but he hadn't touched it. That's when I knew something was wrong. I could see it in his face. I sat down across from him and didn't say a word because I knew what was coming next. I'm breaking up with you. He said it so bluntly. I don't think he knew how else to do it. I asked him why and he said, I don't know. Oh, come on, you must know. Is it another girl? No. Another man? No. He seemed slightly offended on that one, which now looking back at it is pretty funny. Ollie laughs and I give a faint smile. Not really up for laughing along with him at the moment. But in the end, after I begged him for an answer, he said it was because we are both headed down two different roads and he thought it would be better if we ended it before things got too serious. My opinion, though, obviously didn't have a say because no matter what I said, his mind was made up. He even said that he didn't love me anymore. I ran out of there at that point because I couldn't let him see the tears that were beginning to fall and wouldn't stop until I slept the next day. You can tell Ollie is Rain's best friend because he keeps calling her his best friend. This is the pinnacle of character development. Back to my notes for a second. Adam obviously shouldn't have broken up with her in a public setting, especially in a context where it could be confused as a date. But this is actually pretty mature compared to other young adult romances I've endured. And Rain's opinion doesn't matter! If the parties of a relationship aren't on the same page, it's not going to work out! Ever! Ollie then calls Adam a cunt or something and they go watch the Gilmore Girls. We then cut to one year later. Rain is at work. Though the writing was so vague, I didn't know it was her until a few lines in. Rain is now a girl boss. She is a strong, independent woman who has not shown signs of needing a man. When was this transformation? Fuck if I know. Anyway, Ollie, who is also her coworker, tries to introduce her to a male to date, which she takes well. Whoa, wait a minute. Is this a setup? I glare at him. Pretty sure my face is bright red. He just smiles and shrugs his shoulders. Ollie, I cannot begin to tell you how inappropriate this is. Arranging a blind date at my place of work? Are you insane? Well, I don't know when else to do it. You're always working or at home in bed. You would never go out to meet people. Exactly! So don't do it! Did it ever occur to you that maybe I don't want to meet people? I keep rambling on. But it's the same old argument every time he does this. We'll come back to Ollie's setups later, but for now, we need to learn about Rain's job. Ken put me in charge of the company last year. When I came back in, determined to show everyone what I was capable of. He was so impressed with my work ethic that he retired almost immediately. It's everything I've ever wanted. I say what scripts get sent to the big guys and which ones don't. I'm in charge of all off-Broadway productions in New York. I'm the director above the director. It couldn't get any better than this, unless of course Playbill chooses to take on our scripts. Then we wouldn't just be off-Broadway. We would rule all of Broadway. I bring attention to this because there's a subplot, quote unquote, that deals with this. I put subplot in quotes because it doesn't really do anything to move the story along, but there are aspects of it that bleed into the main plot line. But there's no time for that as Rain is still sad. The same pain hits my chest every time Ollie decides to concoct one of these stupid arrangements. He doesn't get it. I tell him I'm fine because I have to. I mask the pain because I have to. I say I'm not lonely because I have to. The second I let these emotions creep in is the second all of this, the success, the, term the termination, the will to live goes away. Rain, it has been one year, 52 weeks, 365 days since Adam broke up with you. You have had time to move on and close that chapter in your life, but you're still reminded of him at every turn? That's not healthy, especially for an adult. How Ollie repeats my sentiments. 
It's been a long time since I've seen the light in your eyes, Rain. You say you're fine, and I want to believe that, but I don't. All you do is work and sleep. Sometimes you don't even sleep. Sometimes you just work until exhaustion takes over and you can't work anymore. I just want to see you happy again. Amber, seriously, stop repeating plot and character aspects we're already familiar with. We cut to that night and Rain is still sad, which to quote my notes, seriously, your relationship didn't seem toxic or abusive. This isn't healthy, Rain. Get therapy. Like, do you want to know healthier ways to get over a breakup? Discuss your feelings, write them out. Don't hide them, engage in some self-care. Avoid unhealthy coping strategies or thought patterns like, you know, working yourself into becoming the CEO. And ultimately, when the time comes, let him go. Find closure, like a normal human being. Ray calls Ollie and asks him to come over, resulting in this fun interaction when he shows up in a tux. Oh my god, you're out with Jessica. Ollie, I am so sorry. Please, go get her. Go. Go on your date. I feel awful for ruining his plans. No, I'm here for you. But this isn't an emergency and I shouldn't be cutting into your personal time. God, Jessica must hate me. She doesn't hate you, Rain. Jessica knows you're like a sister to me and you always come first. He sits down on my couch. At this point, I begin to theorize that Ollie is secretly in love with Rain. Like, he left a date to comfort her and says he's there for her no matter what. We learned the extent of Rain's unhealthy fixation with her breakup, which, might I remind you, was one year ago. I'm so sick of seeing him everywhere. I think I could get past it and move on from him if I just didn't see memories everywhere I look. But every day since he left, I've seen his name, the age he was when I met him, and his birth year on street signs and license plates, and forgive me in a book, because every time I read the page number of his birth year, I pay close attention to every detail on that page to look for a sign, any sign about him, about us or what we had. I can't even listen to music anymore because every long love song reminds me of him. The happy love songs remind me of the good times and the sad. Well, it just depress me even more and I can't take it anymore. I can't take this pain. Seriously, this isn't healthy at all. This is very, very concerning and Rain needs psychological help, not a mystery date. Ollie decides to cheer Rain up by doing what I explicitly just said not to do, signing her up for a dating app. She hesitates. Oh no, I am not going on a dating site. Who knows what kind of creeps are on there? One minute I could be getting ready to go on a date, the next I could have my intestines on the outside of my body! A reminder that this book takes place in 2012, which was pre-tender and pre-admitting you're on a dating site stopped being taboo. Ollie reassures Rain that dating sites aren't just for perverts and booty calls, and she tells him to go back to Jessica. Chapter 3 begins. Rain details Joey- fuck. Chapter 3 begins. Rain details doing her chores for some reason until she caves and goes on the dating site. Also, Rain doesn't swear because she's the pussy. I look at my laptop again. Oh, for Pete's sake. When were you born? October 9th, 1989, Tuesday, four days away. How tall are you? Five foot six. What is your weight? Really? Is that necessary? Do you mean before or after the cherry pies I consumed over the past two days? I press the skip button. What are some of your hobbies slash interests? Working, sleeping, crying, staring at a wall for 10 hours? My actual answers are reading, watching movies, and attending Broadway productions. I didn't mention how I dreamed of one day attending one of my plays on Broadway. And wait, Rain is like... 22? 23? She's 22 and or 23 and the head of a play distribution company? What? We 
We also get some exposition about Ollie and Rain going to Halloween parties in couples costumes because Rain is too dense to realize Ollie's in love with her and also to set up a pointless C plot. Once Rain sets up her account, sans picture of her face, she hits it off with a pig, a uh, murderer, a uh, cop named William, who also doesn't swear or use alcohol terms. But poor Rain is just too paranoid for her own good. So are you free tomorrow night? All red flags rise. Crazy stalker alert. Stop responding now if you want to live. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger! Did you know that 40% of cops met their wives through dating sites? It's true! Google 40% cops' wives! But then Rain sees a familiar face. One that makes her blood run cold. It's... Adam! So Rain is sad again. She spends a lot of time in the book being sad, you find out. But then, she gets an idea. I'm not Rain on this site, I'm Taylor Jones. I could message anyone I knew in real life and they'd have no idea it was me. So what if, what if I messaged him as Taylor Jones, but was still me? What if, what if I can make him fall for me again? Flower Gothic PSA. Do not, under any circumstances, do this. This is manipulative and unhealthy and can make things worse, not only with your ex, but with other people too. Move on! Oh, also, um, don't do this. By 2 p.m. that afternoon, I had had nine cups of coffee with very, very little coffee and lots and lots of sugar. I'm a caffeine addict too, but even I know that's not healthy. Then again, I usually take my coffee black, so... Rain is on edge as Adam doesn't reply and relates it to PMSing, which I've actually never experienced that, so I can't relate. I, I still menstruate, but I, I just, I, I don't get PMS. <laughs> she calls Ollie and explains what she did, but not before Ollie continues to prove that he's in love with her. I'm going to be a better friend from here on out. No more trying to set you up with people. No more dating sites, none of it. I'll just be there for you and you grieve for as long as you need to. I just wish there was something I could do to help. But if comfort comforting you when you're upset is enough, then that's what I'll do. Once Rain does reveal what she did though, Ollie bursts into her apartment the very next chapter, apparently teleporting as it takes place 10 minutes later, and lays out some hard truths. Rain, what the hell are you thinking? This is the same asshole that after one year is still shattering your heart, and you're here in a dating site trying to win him back? Are you out of your freaking mind? Ollie then enables Rain and asks what she sent Adam. She says this. Back when we first began dating, he took me to this fancy restaurant. It was Christmas time, so there were lights shining everywhere, and this place we were at had a balcony. I wouldn't have seen it if the restaurant hadn't been completely packed that night. Normally, they don't see people upstairs. It's for private parties only. But they were so busy, they had to start sitting people up there. Anyway, there was snow covering the balcony and the black iron tables that sat on it. But when they tried to seat us inside, I said, no, I want to sit out there. Instantly, the waiter and Adam began protesting, saying how cold it was and that the balcony was closed for the winter. But I wanted to look at the lights. They're much different than the city's usual billboard lights we see every day. The Christmas lights remind me of home. Even though I don't particularly like my crazy family, I like where I grew up. I wanted to be reminded of that. I wanted to feel the cold and know it was Christmas time. So Adam, being the gentleman that he was, took off his coat and draped it over my shoulders as he opened the sliding glass door onto the balcony. Anyway, he turned to the waiter and said, send me out two hot cocos, please, with extra marshmallows. I gave him a look as if to ask why the extra marshmallows, and it was like he read my mind. It hides the dirt color of the cocoa, he said. I smile at the memory of him. And then we sat on the snow-covered iron seats, 
and drink hot cocoa that sat in front of us on the snow-covered table and ordered our food on the snow-covered balcony. It wasn't until later in our relationship that he told me he hated the cold and he hated snow and he thought he was going to die of hypothermia that night! I'll go through my notes one by one here. One, if Ollie really is Rain's best friend, he would have heard this story before. Two, Seriously, what the fuck is the point of this rambling? There's also a bit where Rain flexes her knowledge by referencing an obscure C.S. Lewis book, but we're gonna avoid that. You're not 18, Rain. Stop doing that. I can flex, though, because I have a 400 intellect, which is four times higher than yours, Rain with a Y. So after this exposition, Rain reveals what she sent to Adam. To answer your question, when I messaged him, I said, snow in the city makes me think of marshmallows and hot cocoa. This beautiful white fluffiness is being forced to merge with this dark, mucky looking substance. But if you put enough marshmallows in the cocoa, it overrides the muckiness and makes it beautiful. Just like when enough snow falls in the city, it hides the pollution of it all. What does snow in the city make you think of? Putting aside the obvious repetition, if I got this message, I would swipe left immediately. Rain is being pretentious, and she knows it. Wow, that's deep. A simple hello wouldn't have done the trick. I mean, don't you think by you saying that, it will give away that it's actually you who messaged him? No, because... Oh god, it's time again. No, because I took it to a deeper meaning than what he did. He just told me he couldn't get past the fact that the cocoa looked like dirt so he'd cover up with marshmallows. I, however, turned it into a simile. Ollie and Rain play some games, including Mancola, which Rain flexes by explaining how the game works. But then, Rain brings out Mystery Date. It's a real game. No one has played it since 2002, but it's real and it exists. Ollie declines to play because Rain is playing the game in real life. Get it? Get it? Get it? Rain asks Ollie if he is going to marry Jessica, which puts him off a bit because remember, he is probably in love with Rain. He then takes his leave. Adam responds to Rain's message two hours later, and this is what he said. Snow in the city reminds me of one of the best nights of my life. I took this one girl I dated to a restaurant in Soho around Christmas time. There were lights everywhere and she couldn't get enough of them. It was her favorite time of the year. Just talking about Christmas would make her eyes light up. Anyway, we get to this restaurant. They have a balcony that's completely covered in snow. I hated the snow back then and the cold, but somehow she persuaded me to sit on the snow covered balcony with her drinking hot cocoa with more marshmallows than cocoa and watching her gaze in awe at the Christmas lights. Sorry to talk about previous date, not the best way to start an online dating chat, but you asked, so I wanted to be honest. And I have concerns. One, Rain, the fact that your happiness is dependent on one man is alarming and is making all of my red flags go off. Two, why would you talk about your ex on a dating site? That's another red flag. And Three, this is the exact same story Rain relayed to us just one page ago. Rain exposes more unhealthy behavior after she asks Adam why she broke up with her, you know, as Taylor. We just grew apart. Sadly, life took us in different directions. She was an amazing girl though. I loved her and again, I'm starting this conversation are totally wrong, LOL. I laugh, it's okay love other people and still love her too. You just have to be ready to move on. Something I've been having trouble doing lately. Okay, maybe I will still get the same story, but life didn't take us in different directions. He forced them in different directions, but he did say he loved me, so if he loved me, why did he leave? Wait a minute. Did I just tell him it's okay to move on from loving me? Because it's so not! End chapter. In chapter 6, Monday rolls around and... We talk all night long Saturday into Sunday morning and then continue talking for most of Sunday afternoon. When evening hit though, he told me he needed to go to sleep because he had to get up early for work. I didn't want to stop talking to him, but I knew I had to be up in the morning too. So we said goodnight. I didn't summarize any of that. Amber Nadine did. Show, don't tell! What the fuck were they talking about? 
Rain goes on a number of tangents about mundane and irrelevant things instead of, you know, stuff that could actually advance the plot and result in character development, downloads the app for Date Me, and... I catch a taxi and give the driver the address. In good traffic, it takes about 15 minutes to get there. Fun fact! Rain, a New York City resident, doesn't, like, walk or take the subway. She just takes a fucking cab everywhere. That is not at all how a New Yorker travels. Hell, the one time I went to NYC, we walked. We used taxis if we had to. Only if we had to. And we were tourists. One look at the official New York City travel guide tells you that you should walk around the city for the most part. New York is an excellent walking city and getting around by foot is the best way to familiarize yourself with neighborhoods and their sometimes subtle divisions. Of course, sometimes you will need to move more quickly or cover great distances for which you've got subways, buses, and cabs at your disposal. Click through each category, for example, MTA subways and buses, for much more detail. And guess what your next option is if you can't walk? If you can't walk to your destination, mass transit is the next best way to get around. And cabs are mostly relegated to the bottom! Grabbing a cab can be ideal when tired feet, heavy luggage, or shopping bags weigh you down. So, um, yeah, moving on. Adam does this and a bit of hell breaks loose. I'm sitting here looking around at all the taxis with girls sitting them and wondering if any of them are you. I look up at all the taxis myself, hoping to see his face, but I don't. There's a girl on my left with her straight brown hair down reading the New York Times, and there's an older lady diagonal to me talking on the phone with her lips pursing stained red. But other than that, I can't really see the people in the other taxis around me. I don't think so. Oh, you're not that older lady incessantly blabbling on the phone, are you? I laugh while looking at the lady with her red stained lips running at the mouth before I realize you just described someone I am looking at. I try not to look around too much because if he sees me, he'll know who I am then, but there's no man in a taxi in sight. Wait, are you on fifth? Just then, the back taxi cab door in the passenger side opens and I begin to protest that this taxi is already taken until I notice it's Ollie. The driver hollers back something about the same thing or Ollie responds with, not to worry sir, we're both headed to the same place. Now putting aside the irrelevant details and Ollie's faux pas, I want to zoom in on this bit. Oh, you're not that older lady incessantly blabbling on the phone, are you? I laugh while looking at the lady with her red stained lips running at the mouth before I realize he just described someone I am looking at. I try not to look around too much because if he sees me, he'll know who I am then, but there's no man in a taxi in sight. Wait, are you on fifth? So I conjured up a conspiracy theory. Ollie is LARPing as Adam on Date Me using his name and image to make Rain fall for him. By which I mean Ollie. I didn't think Amber Nadine was going to go that route though. I mean, it would have been the most obvious and laziest twist she could do. After all, there's gotta be something better, right? There's no time to dive into it though, as the B-plot returns with a vengeance. I check my emails, no response from Playbill or Mr. Huntsworth, so that most likely means they haven't looked over our scripts yet or they aren't interested. I stare at the stack of scripts on my desk that just keeps growing every day and figure if I don't take a whack at it soon, it will probably eat me alive. That play sounds like garbage, especially the title. The title makes it sound like a comedy for Christ's sake. Oh, and also five years of working for the company, Rain? You've been at your professional job since you were 17? Even if you were actually 18 when you got the job, I thought you moved into town for college! Get your backstory straight for the love of God! Anyway, the chapter ends. The next morning, Rain continues to flirt with Adam in a way that's a bit too mushy for people only talking for a few days, using emojis and everything. Nothing happens for the next few pages aside from that, so I want to take some time to talk about the blatant false advertising this book has. 
The selling point is that we're not supposed to know if dating up Adam is who he says he is, but that isn't a plot point that's really expanded upon. Aside from the plot summary, we're given no reason to suspect Adam is someone else. Adam on the side is nothing but sweet terrain, and until the last few chapters, there are only like one or two signs that Adam might not be Adam. There's no conflict, and there's no reason for me to care. It's kind of like how I wrote things in high school and early college. I didn't realize that I didn't need to go through every single thing my characters are doing, regardless of plot or relevance. It dilutes the conflict, if there's any at all. And that's not how you should write. And I can speak from experience. I've taken, like, actual writing classes before. Hell, I kept my textbook from one of them, and they say... Conflict is a fundamental element of fiction. In life, conflict often carries negative connotations. Yet in fiction, be it comic or tragic, dramatic conflict is fundamental because, in literature, only trouble is interesting. Only trouble is interesting. This is not so in life. Life offers periods of comfortable communication, peaceful pleasure, and productive work, all of which are extremely interesting to those involved. But passages about such times by themselves make for dull reading. They cannot be used as a whole plot. You can't just have your book be full of lulls. Having Rain do a couple of things outside the main plot is fine, but the main plot should be the focus of our attention, especially since we are, like, supposed to care about Rain and her conflicts. That isn't to say all fiction needs to be like that. Experimental fiction, metafiction, nonlinear narratives, and postmodern works can all bend and stretch the rules to their liking. However, Mystery Date is not trying to be metafictional or postmodern. It's supposed to be a romantic suspense thriller, and the author's tangents aren't woven into the story well enough to not make them distracting or meaningless. The lulls don't add anything to the narrative compared to, say, anything Kurt Vonnegut wrote. They just don't have a point. Speaking of lulls, this next chapter happens to be Rain's 23rd birthday. And practically all the chapter is devoted to that. Ollie even breaks into her apartment and makes pan cakes for her. They're basically pancakes made with cake batter. I would make them, but I've already filled my cooking on camera quota for this quarter. Oh, and apparently Jessica does want to marry Ollie intensely. Oh no, she definitely does. She's had everything right down to the date picked out since two Februarys ago. She has everything set so that we could literally have a full out wedding next week. Oh, Ollie, that's great. I mean, a little soon, but still great. No, it's not great. It's not just a little soon, it's way too soon. Not to mention a wedding isn't supposed to be spontaneous and she's definitely not supposed to expect it. As per my notes, Jessica planning out her wedding is normal, I think. I was never the wedding crazy kind growing up, so I can't speak for that. But the marriage is never supposed to be a surprise. The proposal is supposed to be, but the marriage is not. You know how Adam and Rain broke up because the former saw them on different paths? Yeah, unless both of you are on the same path, it ain't gonna work out. Oh, and we must also be reminded that Rain is quirky and not like other girls. Plus, we as girlfriends, fiancés, wives act as your mothers because guys never really grow up and always seem to need guidance and someone to clean up after them anyway. Unless you're the girlfriend, then it's the other way around. I look around my apartment at the male 
high on the sky high on the coffee table next to the multitude of scripts that I still have to read, the dishes in the sink that seem to always be there, and of course, there's that pile of clothes in my room that I keep picking from and spraying perfume on them before I wear them just so they don't smell like they need to be dipped in acid to get clean. At this point, I added to my crack theory. Ollie was not only LARPing his hat up, but he killed him and assumed his identity as some sort of convoluted scheme to get rain. Like, that would just be so stupid and the most obvious twist, right? Right? For the next while, Amber focuses on the B-plot, where Rain tries to convince the CEO of Playbill, Mr. Playbill, to something something help her expand her play production business. Still not quite sure what she does, to be honest. Playbill asks to see the best plays under Rain's supervision. I guess, and she works to edit Mary Beans and Stranger Things, which I'll be calling the Bean Play from here on out because the title is so fucking stupid, so it can be sent to Playbill. And as you would expect, the play is supposed to be a metaphor for Rain's dating life, so let me reiterate what it's supposed to be about. So our main character is Josie an upper-class girl. She's deeply in love with and wants to marry Farmer Gray, a bean farmer. However, Josie's friend, Sanders, is also in love with her. He's an upper-class man who is the stepson of the King of England. So what does Sanders do? He kills Farmer Gray and attempts to marry Josie himself by wearing the farmer's clothes. Does this go well? We'll find out later. Now, if it isn't obvious, Josie is meant to represent Rain and Farmer Gray is supposed to represent Adam. So who is Sanders? You'll see. If you know, you know. Now, I get what Amber was trying to do here. She wanted to add something that could be foreshadowing, something that could work as a metaphor for her own work, but this is so badly written that it at best distracts, but at worst recalls what has already happened It spoils what will happen. And that's not the only case of metaphor we will see. There's a whole ass dream sequence later that does nothing but spew some anti-therapist bullshit and once again reveals the twist! We'll come back to that later. Anyway, sorry for this tangent, I just needed to get that out of my system. Let's get back to the book at hand. So Ollie finds out Rain is talking to William, the cop, and uh, this happens. Oh, he's cute. Wait a minute. He's a cop? Yes, why? What's wrong with cops? Rain, do you not know that all cops are bad guys? God, don't talk to him. Don't think about him. In fact, lock him right now. So a couple things. What? Is this seriously how pro-cop people view ACABs like me? Holy fuck, they are so dense. And two, did, did Ollie actually kill Adam? Is he spewing this ACAB shit just to cover up his tracks? I, I was just saying that Ollie killed Adam as a joke. There there's no way Amber was that lazy with her writing, right? William is blocked by Rain, but then is immediately unblocked because of course he is, and theorizes that Ollie is in love with her. Though Rain doesn't give him his real name, she has to keep up her gamut, of course. Hey, sorry about that, my friend saw me messaging you and he flipped out on me, he told me to block you immediately, and wouldn't leave my office until I did. It's so strange, I have no idea why he got so upset. Hmm. That is strange. Do you mind if I ask what's his name? I don't want to tell him his real name. I barely know this man. I don't mind. It's Sully Willows. Hmm, name doesn't sound familiar. Maybe he has a thing for you? That's what everyone keeps saying, but I don't see how. Him and his curly girlfriend have been together for years and they're so happy it's almost sickening, huh? huh? Oh my god, Rain, how are you this dead? 
Then we meet Mr. Playbill, that little subplot starts, and seriously, Rain, what is your job? What the hell do you do? Do you supervise productions? Do you listen to plays? What do you do? Mr. Playbill is obviously impressed by Rain's achievements, especially since she has done it all at 23. They talk for a little bit, and Rain expresses surprise that businessmen could be so casual. What? Anyway, he's impressed enough to ask her to fax him three scripts by next Thursday. Rain, some advice. Send in the scripts you have already produced and have shown success. This is the one time you can flex yourself without consequence. Rain tells Adam what happened, and Adam also talks about how good of a person Ollie seems and that he's such a good friend. Not much happens for the next while. I go on a couple tangents saying Ollie is a serial killer and he killed Adam, and Rain recaps shit that already happened, and I continued to suffer. Ollie comes by and, hey, remember that couple's costume thing? It's back with a vengeance! Ollie didn't get the Little Mermaid costumes in time, and he must pick something with Rain, who gives us this exact opposite of a gem. He gives me a look. I knew I should have ordered them back in May. I can't believe this! His temper tantrums never last long, but when he has them, I find myself wondering if he has a little bit of Asperger's. I googled it once and read the symptoms, but he didn't have any of them except for the freakouts. So I assume he just has low patience or only a little bit of Asperger's. Can a person just have a little bit of Asperger's? Amber, that is not how neurodiversity works. This is very insensitive and perpetuates stereotypes about people on the spectrum. You can't just say that someone has a little bit of neurodiversity because they are stubborn and refuse to listen to you. Not everyone on the spectrum has that particular quirk, and those that do would greatly appreciate it if you didn't chalk that up to just being difficult or having tantrums. Being on the spectrum, at least to someone like me who is actually neurodivergent, is unique. At times, it's like I'm an alien trying to figure out how humans interact on a day-to-day -day basis. I understand social cues, but I still struggle from time to time when it comes to shifts in a conversation. And Amber, shit like this is harmful. I've hidden my neurodiversity from the public eye for years because people would assume everyone on the autism spectrum is aggressive and obsessive and can't have normal human relationships. Especially considering how you characterize Ollie later on in the book. That might not have been your intent, Amber, but I really wish you had done your research beforehand. So Ollie tries to harass Rain into picking a couple's costume because he just has to go to the work Halloween party with her, and not Jessica because she hates Halloween. How fucking convenient! The chapter ends with Rain recapping the Playbill thing, and Ollie is happy. I continue to lose my sanity. The next chapter immediately returns to the Playbill plot. Fuck trying to connect everything! This is Amber's story, and she does what she wants! Rain starts the chapter saying that she's stupid. I mean, she is, but not for the reasons she thinks. She did not take my advice and ended up editing the Bean play because it was just so meaningful to her. So come Thursday and surprise, surprise, her fax machine is broken. What does she do? Take a cab? Force Ollie to deliver them? Lay down and cry? No. After panicking for way too long, Rain herself speed walks to the Playbill office, deals with a snarky secretary, and manages to get her goddamn way after way too fucking long of a chapter, like seriously, and had a weird tangent about boiled eggs that it made no fucking sense. But then, disaster strikes! 
What I see before me is a body lying on the ground in the middle of the road, blood seeping from its head. Cars are stopped, horns are blaring, and the woman, who I assume was the driver of the car that hit the pedestrian, is standing over the body talking to her cell phone. She seems horribly panicked. I began walking toward the person and fear strikes at me as I recognize the face in the body. God, please no! I walk faster and I need to scream, but no words come out! I fall down on my knees because sign the body and the only thing I can say comes out like a whisper. So quiet. Not even the tiniest mouse could hear it. Ollie. Excuse me, what the fuck? I think fuck. Excuse me, what the fuck? I think this was supposed to be an emotional scene, but this comes right the fuck out of nowhere and it's instant mood whiplash. I don't care enough about anyone here to feel anything. What the fuck is this? So yeah, Ollie straight up gets hit by a car. Does this have any actual importance to the plot? Only in two ways. First, we learn the truth about Jessica after Ollie didn't include her on his emergency contacts list. He's fucked up and drugged enough to tell Rain. So did you find out? Find out what? By Jessica. About Jessica? I'm very confused for a minute and then think maybe he's not as alert as I originally thought. But then I remember. Oh, you mean that she's not on your emergency contact list? Yeah, why is that? He wastes a minute to respond. I think he's falling back to sleep. She's not with me anymore. Hasn't been for years. Surprise! Jessica is out of the picture and has been for years. Did he kill her? Did he dump her to pursue Rain? Who knows? And second, Rain messages Adam and William about Ollie's situation. William responds, but Adam is dead silent. It's almost as if Ollie is pretending to be Adam and is secretly in love with her. Wow. Rain doesn't realize it though, as she's stupid enough to believe Ollie's lies. This is the me that knows what's going on and is telling the truth. I don't even remember what I said. I was so heavily drugged. You're the only one on my emergency contact list because I trust you fully. I trust Jessica too, but she isn't as wise when it comes to doctors. Plus she hates hospitals. <laughs> reminded that Amber Nadine is a Taylor Swift simp. And now here to perform her number one hit single, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, here's Taylor Swift. The camera pans to show Taylor standing outside on a red stage, because I, I guess red is the day before her new album, judging by the poster hanging behind her. Ugh, please no, Ollie says disgusted. What? I thought you liked Taylor Swift, I asked him. No, I, I, I do. That's not Taylor Swift. That's a pop singer who's abandoning her country roots. If I have to hear we are never ever getting back together one more time, I think I'm going to go insane. I know she's taking on a new sound, but I like it. I think the song is super catchy. He rolls his eyes at me. You would. I turn the volume up louder and start singing along with the TV. God, please, no rain. This is a good bedside manner. I can't even cover both my ears. I sing louder. And then we get racism. She's a big, sassy black woman named Chantiers. Her and I were chatting earlier while Ollie was resting. She's super nice and super funny, but I think I like her even more now because guess what song she's humming? Oh no, not you too, he groans. You're complaining. That's a good sign. She looks at me. Means he's getting better. She winks. I smile and Ollie just lays his head back on the pillow. So done with the both of us. The name Sean Tace gave me zero Google results and the description we get of her is super discomforting. She's not just the only BIPOC character in the book, but she's a fucking mammy stereotype? What the fuck? Also, guess what happens when Ollie comes to you for real life? Adam messages! Which leads us to... So in case you haven't figured it out yet, I was right. My 600 intellect correctly predicted that Ollie was LARPing as Adam on the dating site, Jessica was long gone, 
And the Bean play was a thinly veiled metaphor for Rain's life, with Rain as Josie, Adam as Gray, and Ollie as Sanders. I'll go into the specifics later, but for now, I'm gonna skip over the stupid resolution for the pointless costume plot and other stupid subplots. Just... Allow me to talk about how terribly this is written. Remember how Mystery Date promises to be a suspenseful thriller? In this thriller suspense novel, the saying, be careful who you meet online, couldn't be more fitting. Only the tail end of the book has a sense of suspense. Most of it is Rain happily puttering along, doing her job, and trying to win back Adam, with the only hints at the twist to be in the stuff I already mentioned. You aren't supposed to find out about Ollie killing Adam and pretending to be him until the end, but I guessed it before the halfway point. Like, romantic thrillers are possible to execute. The example that comes to mind is, surprisingly, Gone Girl. It's technically not a romantic thriller, but Gone Girl manages the mystery behind Amy's disappearance very well. It's slowly revealed that Amy planned to incriminate her husband, Nick, and that the two were unreliable narrators. Both Amy and Nick are jerk asses in their own right. They both contribute to their marriage's downfall and their perspectives are slowly unraveled. In Mystery Date, the twist isn't revealed little by little. Rain doesn't have any reason to fear for her life, and Adam isn't at all hinted to be not what he seems. As a result, I don't remember much about the middle part of the book. My notes were just me wanting to die, yelling at Rain to run, and saying Ollie was a murderer. Hell, while working on the read aloud for this book, I realized that the twist wasn't just obvious, but blatantly obvious. Ollie dresses up as Adam when Rain finally decides to meet Adam face to face. Rain's mom and grandma meet Ollie, who they instantly think is marrying Rain and are 100% supportive. And I was right. My 750 intellect correctly guessed that Adam was dead all along. He was killed by Ollie. We'll cover that in detail later, but for now, let me keep on explaining why this twist sucks. Amber, you picked the most obvious twist for your book. That Rain's best friend is secretly in love with her and is using her ex's pictures to get in her pants. Now, this could have worked if you were less obvious about it. Maybe have Ollie be less of a shitty liar, or not have nearly as many instances where he's super obsessive over Rain. I'm not saying you can't have those at all, but to make your twist work, you need to do it in a way where when your reader rereads your work, they say, oh, I should have noticed that. It all makes sense now. You know how in real mystery and suspense novels there are subtle clues that lead to the truth? Clues that you don't think much about until you revisit the work? That's what you need to work on to make this plot work, Amber. And even then, I think there's a better plot that could be utilized if the characters weren't so fucking stupid! But more on that later. Once again, I suck at winking. I apologize. <laughs> so nothing else of note happens until Rain and Ollie hang out on Halloween. And even then, it's the only thing of significance until page 138. Surprise, surprise, they win the costume contest and they return to Rain's apartment to watch The Vow, which could be another metaphor pertaining to Rain's love life. We get a summary of the vow, and Ollie claims he and Jessica are still working things out. Rain believes him because remember, she's an idiot. We get Ollie's backstory in one long paragraph. Ollie grew up in Southern California in a trailer park full of druggies. Any drug you can imagine was being used in the neighborhood. His parents were never really the most suitable people to have a child. 
their relationship is pretty much identical to the story between behind the song Love the Way You Lie by Eminem and Rihanna. And their parenting skills were much better. They tried making Ollie move out when he was 16 because they didn't want him living with them anymore. Their motto was, if he can drive, he can survive. But that went against the government's child labor laws. He didn't ever abuse him, just didn't really act like he existed. So when he turned 18, he moved as far from them as he could without leaving the United States to the good old Big Apple. And he hasn't talked to them since. They don't care, and he never really seems to care either. But sometimes I wonder if there's still a child inside of him missing the pre parental care he never got. And okay, first off, way to age your audience by referencing an Eminem featuring Rihanna music video. I know the video you're talking about, but only because my brother was obsessed with Rihanna and other female pop singers when he was a toddler. Second, I was wrong for once. My 900 intellect didn't realize the backstory wouldn't be brought up again. But I feel it was included in order to justify Ollie's behavior as ew, ew, abandoned child bad. Amber, may I direct you to some James Bond characters? Tracy Bond? Madeline Swan? They both had shitty childhoods, but they weren't obsessive serial killers, were they? Hell, Blofeld had a fine childhood, but is the most fucked up villain of the lot. Jesus Christ, my brain is irreversibly poisoned. Anyway, after this info dump, Rain comforts Ollie and he looks at me for a moment and then kisses me. For some strange reason, I kiss him back, but then I realize what is happening and I push him away. Ollie, looking at him through disappointed eyes, shaking my head. I understand you're upset and confused, but you need to go back home and work things out with Jessica right now. Rain, can you not be selfless for one fucking second and realize y'all love each other? Come on! Then the aforementioned dream sequence happens. Afterwards, we get to Thanksgiving! This leads us to... Rain's mom and grandma are appropriately obnoxious, thinking she's gonna marry Ollie just because he came with her for Thanksgiving. They all go to the mall for Black Friday. Rain and Ollie ogle each other, and then we get to Victoria's Secret and experience homophobia. She wasn't going to give you a breast exam, Rain. She was going to feel how the bra fit you. The bra that I didn't even want to try on in the first place. And do you know that almost 80% of the women that work here are probably lesbians? <laughs> she gives me a shocked look, but I don't stop. Yeah, they are. And I can tell you that they don't feel you up to help you figure out which size is best for you. They probably don't even need a background check to work here. They all probably live in a whorehouse. Okay, I'm just gonna bring out my notes again for this. What the fuck, Amber? Lesbians aren't perverts that use their job to feel others' breasts. That kind of rhetoric is the same kind those on the right are using to try and justify discriminating against and murdering people like me and my friends. I don't care if you are tired. Fuck you! So Rain rage quits on the shopping adventure, but Ollie follows her out the store. Finally, admits to breaking up with Jessica, albeit still with his shitty warped narrative, claiming they broke it off after the whole marriage drama, and the two kiss. Again. And then they make love. But not until they get to Rain's parents' place, obviously. The next morning, you know, after they fucked, Rain realizes what she did and feels awful for it, despite having some feelings for him for a while. She tries to convince Ollie to go back to Jessica because remember, she's a fucking idiot and can't see what's in front of her. Ollie is understandably pissed at Rain's 180 and sulks back to NYC without her. That night, she goes home, tells Adam about her fallout with Ollie, and the two make plans to meet at that restaurant where the snow thing happened. So Rain gets stressed, goes there, and surprise! My 1000 intellect guessed correctly. 
Hi, I say softly so as to not completely startle him. He slowly turns around and I can only imagine the look on my face when I realize the person standing in front of me wasn't, isn't who I was expecting. I think it could just be a coincidence, but when I look down to his jacket to see he's wearing a yellow rose, still in shock, I look back into his familiar eyes. Ollie? But why? Why did he do it? I just kept telling myself just to be there for her more than anyone else. She'll come around eventually, but no, all you ever saw was Adam. I needed you to see me. This was the only way I knew how to do it. Please don't be mad at me. Rain appropriately is pissed at Ollie for his deception and tells him to never speak to her again. A week passes and we get to the penultimate chapter where we finally receive some, you know, conflict, mystery, suspense. Rain finally has the gall to call Jessica and she tells her what we already knew. Rain, I don't know what Ollie's been telling you, but he and I broke up the night you last saw me. And it doesn't stop there! Jessica described Ollie as quite the stalker. She waits a minute as if she's unsure she should actually say what she's thinking. I need to warn you about something. At first I thought it was sweet how much he cared for you. He never stopped talking about you and how you two were so close, but something changed. Something happened that made him different, obsessive. It got to the point where even at night I would wake up to the sound of him screaming your name in his sleep. But it wasn't out of fear or love, it was sinister. That night at the Christmas party when I saw the way he was looking at you, I had had enough. I wasn't going to live like that anymore in the shadow of someone else, so I left. But if he's still the way he was, Rain, he's not safe to be around. Stay as far from him as possible. Okay. Objection! If Jessica was on good terms with Rain, why didn't she warn her about Ollie when they broke up? Wouldn't that, like, be important? Wouldn't that make her a good friend? So while Rain's on her little phone call, Ollie approaches her from behind and knocks her out. He takes her to his place, ties her up on his bed, and we get the reveal. Buckle up, buckaroos. It's a long one. Rain, I've wanted you for so long. The day you walked into the office to apply for a job, I knew, I knew I had to have you. But that bitch, Jessica, stood in the way of everything. She said I couldn't have you too. I had to choose. Finally, she left. But you never saw me the way I wanted you to, no matter what I did. I was always the brother or the best friend, never the boyfriend. And then Adam stepped into the picture and my chance to make you mine was gone. I knew I didn't stand a chance with him around. When he came to me and told me he was going to ask you to marry him, I threatened him, told him to leave you, and never contact you again, or I'll kill him. But then you couldn't get over it. You cried and cried, and no matter how much I was there for you, you still only saw him. Can you imagine what that was like for me? I kept trying to set you up with other men who I knew were juice bags, so you could see that no man in this world could be as good as me, but you refused to even look at some of them. It became thrilled when you joined DateMe.com because I thought, well, maybe she'll find my profile and we could talk about being more than friends. His tone changes from happy to evil in a matter of seconds, but no, you found his profile instead. So I tracked him down, knocked him out, brought him here, tied him exactly to who you are now. He asked why I brought him here. You were wrong, by the way. The message that you sent him told him it was actually you and not Taylor. I tortured him until he told me the password for date me. Got to admit, you picked a good one. He knew why I wanted the password. He loved you so much that he went through losing every finger and still wouldn't tell me. When I began to carve into his chest to remove his heart was when he finally told me. I left for an hour, messaged you for the first time as him and came back but he was still bleeding out. He was tough as nails, that boy. I told him he wasn't needed anymore. I was now him and you now had me. And I put the poor soul out of his misery. Again. Objection! Adam, couldn't you just tell Rain, hey, your BFF threatened to kill me. Can we like flee the city and go into hiding? There are many points where this entire plot could have been avoided. Jessica could have warned Rain about Ollie. Adam could have told Rain Ollie's threat. Rain could have not fallen for Ollie's lies. But everyone here is just so stupid. Anyway, Ollie almost kills Rain, but guess who saves her? William, the cop. They even get together at the end. Cool. I guess. And then we get the epilogue. Ollie was sentenced to death a few weeks later. The death penalty is abolished in New York. It has been for decades. It's legal in Pennsylvania where the author's from, but even then executions have been formally suspended. 
Oh, and the average wait period for an execution is around 20 years, give or take. And the Playbill, uh, and Playbill picked up the Bean Play, yay! And a premiere on Broadway, yay! But Rain still has a bit of trauma. The end! So, do you see why this book hasn't left my subconscious after four years? It's bad, yes, but it's bad in a way where you can't look away. It's like seeing a car crash. It's horrific, but you can't look away. From its lack of plot to the fact that it's not really even a thriller novel, it's something you have to read to believe. I don't recommend buying this book. It's only worth reading once, and once you know the twist, it's ruined for you. But for now, I shall take my leave. Good night, my loves, and I will see you next time. Hello! It's me, Flower Gothic. I'm back, and for the uh, credits, I wanted to read the um, author notes. A note from the author. Hello! How are you doing? I'm Amber Nadine, and I'm the author of the book you just read. Oh, what's that? You didn't read it? You're just reading the note first? You don't want to do that. Again, with this fucking meta-narration. The fact that it's Amber herself, like, doing this in her voice kind of makes me wonder, is Rain supposed to be representative of her? Trust me, this note has several spoilers in it that will ruin the entire story for you. So before you read this little note of mine, please go back to the beginning of this book and read all the way through. I'll wait, hums along patiently to elevator music. Again with this fucking meta narration! Normally I wouldn't be as pissy about it in the author's notes, but that's, this is basically how the entire fucking book was written, so shut the fuck up! What's that? You finished reading the book? Oh, great. How'd you like it? Oh, I see. Well, I'm sorry to hear if it's upset you so much, but if I'm being honest, this means I've succeeded at doing my job. What the fuck? You see, us authors thrive off of innocent readers' tears. It's something we strive for because dot dot dot. If we can make you cry, that means you felt a connection to the characters in their story. Don't think that's how it works, but okay. This story became yours. No, it didn't. And with every little bump in the road, you felt it. I predicted the twist before the halfway point, Amber. Shut the fuck up. And that's exactly what we authors want. To make you feel! I'm sorry. I'm getting a little off topic here. What I want to discuss with you in this note of mine is that this book you just finished is a work of fiction. It's not real! No shit! <laughs> But in order for you to completely understand what the story is about, I had to make certain things real. For instance, Rain still had to catch a taxi to go to work every morning. She couldn't just randomly appear at work and then randomly appear back at her apartment. Amber. Amber. My love. Honey. You didn't need to, like, emphasize every fucking time she went to and from work. Like, your reader will understand if the next chapter happens to be at Rain's apartment or at Rain's workplace. They're not going to be scratching their heads thinking, oh, dearie, gee willikers, I wonder how she got there. Because it's fiction. You can like cut out some of the fat of your day-to-day -day lives to just get to the meat of your content. Well, I mean, she could, but then this book would be called Harry Potter and the Mystery Date, and then I would get sued for stealing J.K. Rowling's characters. Honestly, at that point, that would be very based. So what I'm trying to say is a lot of the stuff that you read about is real. The Flatiron Building does exist, and Rain does have to pass it to get to the Playbill office. I honestly forgot that entire detail. But the Playbill office isn't low hated where I say it is in the book. I am not even sure if a Playbill office does exist or if it's even located in Manhattan. I don't know if there's a Mr. Playbill and I'm pretty sure he does not certify script distribution companies to be on Broadway status. Again, pretty sure that's not how Broadway works. What I do know is that Playbill is a monthly magazine for theater goers. It keeps you up to date on what's Rain, I understand what it is! 
What I do know is that Playbill is a monthly magazine for theater goers. It keeps you up to date on what's happening in the theater in industry. I also don't think script distribution companies such as Playkind Incorporated actually exist. Fun fact, they do, but not necessarily on like a Broadway scale, I believe. It's mostly just for like local theater, school theater. But this is what I went from. This is what I wanted Ray to do, so I made it up. Dateme.com is not a real dating site. No shit. However, if it were, I would not advise you to join it. As you can see, things didn't pan out so well for Rain or Adam or Ollie. The Simmons is not a real theater. I named after my favorite author, Kristen Simmons. If you haven't heard of her, I highly suggest reading some of her books. All of them are amazing. Kristen Simmons writes young adult dystopian fiction. That is definitely not my thing. Yeah, but Iron Widow is actually good. The Erhard Theater isn't a real theater either. I named after my favorite actress slash singer, Hilary Erhard Duff. Lizzie McGuire? You, you named your theater after Lizzie McGuire? Okay. She's pretty much been my inspiration for everything I've done creatively, including writing. Her book Elixir came out in 2010, and about a year after that, I began writing my first book, Number 17, which we're not gonna read because... She was a minor at that time. It was also not snowing December 5th of 2012. That was my 16th birthday, by the way, smiley face, in New York City. In fact, it was actually sunny with a high of 54 degrees Fahrenheit. But I wanted the effect of cold and snow during the big climactic scene. I'm going to rub salt on your wounds a little and tell you the state of New York I'm alone. I'm going to rub salt on your wounds a little with this one and tell you that the state of New York no longer enforces capital punishment. Reading after the year 2004, any sort of execution, including lethal injection, has been prohibited. Therefore, in reality, Ollie would have lived. Yeah, I, I just made up the fact that, you know, capital punishment is still a thing in New York because, you know, I thought it would make for a good ending. And, you know, I don't care if that's just blatantly untrue, even though I try to incorporate all of this reality into my book, because I just wanted a good story. I know you're probably screaming at me right now, then why kill him, Amber? Why? My answer to you is this. Happy endings don't leave you thinking about the story days after. You hear the words happily ever after, and you are happy for a bit, but it doesn't hold on to you. It doesn't drive you nuts. Also, I wanted Ollie to be completely out of the picture. Rain can move on and make a beautiful life for herself, and although she will always be questioning everyone she meets for the rest of her life, she could have peace of mind knowing Ollie can never touch her again. Plus, I have a really interesting mind that loves in twist writing twisted stories like this. Again, I predicted the twist before the halfway point. Anyway, there are probably other little details I missed that are not necessarily accurate, but I wanted to point out those few things in particular. I wanted to say thank you to you that if J.R. Tolkien can write an entire series of make-believe world of make-believe creatures, there's, there's no reason I can write a novel based in the real world with a few inaccurate details here and there. Except said inaccurate details kind of ruin your story, ma'am. It's not the full truth, but it's not full fiction either. However, it is pure fun, smiley. Thank you so much for reading my very first novel. You have no idea what it means, how much it means to me. I hope you enjoyed reading it, despite the fact you may still be crying right now. My eyes are dry. I need to put eye drops in. All my love, Ollie, Clear's Third, I mean Amber.